My name is Eric Ward, and I am the Executive Director of Western State Center. Western State Center is a progressive civil rights organization based in the Pacific Northwest, and we work to expand racial and gender equity through policy and community-based organizing. So, so here in the Pacific Northwest, we are dealing with dynamics that I suspect others in, in the country are also experiencing. Uh, we just uh, have experienced them for longer. And, and one of them is, is a backlash against inclusion and uh, multiracial democracy. And it has taken shape in the form of white nationalism. It is, it is a social movement. And I distinguish it from white supremacy, a, a system of, of uh, discrimination. Um, and this white nationalist movement is, is a violent movement that seeks the overthrow of the US government. Um, and the forced expulsion of all people of color um, and Jews. So while white supremacy may have been constructed on exploitation, right, uh, the white nationalist movement is uh, birthed in um, violence and, and ethnic cleansing. You know, we have dealt with this in the Pacific Northwest for uh, over three decades in a, in a very intense way. Um, the rest of the country has begun to experience this um, in the midst of, of the Trump presidency in, in very uh, violent ways. In fact, over the last uh, four years, uh, over 250 Americans have been murdered uh, by white nationalists, uh, making it the most violent uh, terrorist organization and movement um, uh, in the United States. But What's important is in the moment where we're having a struggle around national identity and citizenship and civil rights, uh, we have also been hit with the specter of a global pandemic under the coronavirus. And uh, that has created an extra layer of pressure on our society. So along with this white nationalist movement, along with the Trump presidency, along with uh, uh, this global pandemic. And now um, the rise of police brutality and vigilante violence, um, democracy is under strain in America. Um, many of us sit at home and we think this is about uh, simply the brutality that we as black Americans experience and face. But the truth is, is that we are all on a precipice right now and the vehicle of democracy is very close to going over the edge. And if that happens, uh, it won't just be the most vulnerable in society uh, who feel that, uh, but all of us will experience that. And that's why it's so important in this moment uh, to support the movement for Black Lives. The Pacific Northwest has its own peculiar history Right, the state I live in, Oregon, has one of the smallest black populations of, of any state. Um, our city, Portland, Oregon, has one of the, as a major city in America, has one of the smallest black populations in America. Uh, that, uh, like most of racism and bigotry in our society, uh, has a specific reason. And, and the reason is, is that uh, when the United States uh, came, when Oregon came into the Union, uh, it had to decide whether it wanted to be a free state or a slave state. Um, and Oregon decided not to be a slave state. Now, we might want to root that fact, uh, but the truth is, is that the reason Oregon chose not to be a slave state was because it wanted no Black people in its territories at all. In fact, it was illegal for African Americans to reside within the territories of Oregon. And that did not change with any substantial numbers until World War II when black workers were needed uh, for the ship docks. And so we live uh, in a state that was actually birthed in white nationalism, in the idea of a white only state. 
and uh, it has experienced the the legacy of that uh, ever since. Uh, in the 80s, we had the rise of the Aryan Nations, which was a white nationalist organization uh, that promoted armed revolution and the overthrow of the Pacific Northwest and the creation of a, of a white-only state. Uh, that included bombings, assassinations, armored car robberies, uh, hate crimes, and violence. But what's important to remember about Oregon and, and the Pacific Northwest when it comes to white nationalists is Hate groups don't come to town bringing racism or anti-Semitism, Islamophobia or homophobia with them. They simply organize the bigotry that already exists. If white nationalists have found fertile ground uh, in our region, it is because of the unaddressed structural racism and other forms of bigotry that still very much exist here. So I think it's important for those listening to, to remember uh, that this is a critical moment, right? It is, it is a time to act, and that means movement. That means being in organizations like Fellowship of Reconciliation or Western State Center or any other organization. It's, you cannot make a difference as an individual. You need to be part of community, and being part of community means understanding the threat we are in. If you think things are fine, uh, nothing I'm going to say is going to convince you otherwise. If you are like most Americans who understand that nearly half of America, uh, American adults are now unemployed in this country, who understand the brutalization that African Americans and indigenous communities and, and Latinos face, who understand that now for nearly three years that there are children who have been disappeared and placed into camps uh, called detention centers around the country because they are, or their parents are immigrants or, or undocumented. Uh, you have to know that things will continue to get worse unless we raise our voices, unless we build power. So I tell folks that there are four specific things you can be doing, right? The first, as I just said, is being an organization. The next, right, is finding ways to support the black civil rights struggle that is happening in this country. Right now, there are the largest demonstrations that have been taking place uh, in the history of the US, right? And it doesn't mean that you have to join those marches. You can make phone calls, you can write emails, you can get your friends on a virtual um, a Zoom or Google, right? And you can each like write postcards at the same time. You can donate dollars. You can put messages on your sidewalk. There are lots of ways to raise your voice right now and you have to. The third is to continue, right? To push our elected officials at the local level, our mayors, city councilors and, and commissioners to step up and lean into this moment with their moral and political authority. What happens at the local community uh, is critically important and we should not be allowing, right, the targeting of nonviolent protesters uh, with police violence and vigilante violence. It is simply unbecoming of a democracy. The third, is that those of us who are engaged in peacemaking, right, need to prepare. We are in a moment right now where civilians are being targeted by vigilante and white nationalist violence uh, and law enforcement. If we truly believe in our nonviolent values, we are called on to place ourselves in between those nonviolent protesters, right, and those who seek to brutalize them. Right? We don't have to agree with the entire platform of these protesters. We don't have to agree with the folks who try to attach themselves to these protests to commit acts of violence or other forms of nihilism. But we can believe in nonviolence and we can believe in inclusive democracy. And it's time to put our bodies between those who are trying to save democracy 
and those who are trying to attack them for it. We have to talk to others. Uh, we, I don't know if it calls on us to be uh, self-righteous in our conversations, but it certainly calls on us to, to have courageous conversations right now. Um, you know, black leaders are exhausted right now, right? They are struggling to hold on to their communities. They are, uh, they are standing up for the rest of us, right? They're, they're not just trying to save their lives. They're trying to save our lives as well, right? And I say that as, as an older African-American, right? And I say that for folks who aren't black. They are trying to save your lives too. And that means, right, not making them have to drag us, right, into the promised land, right? It, it means understanding, right, that we do not want to, none of us want to stay in the place we are in now, right? There is, this is not a place of joy. This is a place of scarcity. This is a place of hatred. And it is time for us to move on. Uh, but to move on means we have to bring as many people as possible. And that means white folks too. This is their home we are trying to take them to. And so I, I encourage white allies to not have selfish and self-righteous conversations, right? It's not about what you are feeling in this moment. It is not about your anger. It is about courageous conversations with your family members, with your neighbors, right? To try to understand what values do you have in common right now? Not ideology, right? But values. And to try to help them understand that those values best get met when all of us can live, love, and work free from fear. It's a hard conversation. I don't envy our white allies for having to have those conversations, but they are brave and courageous conversations, and you will be remembered for those conversations. I think the values that align many of us, regardless of our, you know, ideology, regardless if we're Republican or Democrat or conservative or liberal or, you know, whatever uh, uh, latest, right, binary description, uh, left, right. I mean, really what we're talking about are not ideologies, but inclusion versus exclusion. And that's a value, right? Fairness is a value. Wanting to work hard is a value. Safety is a value. Wanting what's best for our children is a value. Loving the place that we live, those are values. Those aren't ideologies. And there are too many folks out there politicizing those values and trying to turn them into ideologies, right? Uh, and turning them into ideologies creates a scarcity right? And we don't actually live in scarcity. We live in a society of abundance. We actually live in a world of abundance. Inside of us are abundance. We are creative, hardworking, loving people, right? And we forget that when we dive into our ideologies. And so it's getting to the core of things that we all want, right, for one another, hopefully, but we certainly want them for our loved ones and our children. And that's where these conversations need to start. And in terms of, you know, policies, you know, I think certainly we, we have to understand that the 20th century policing system, right, uh, is now is obsolete. If it ever had a place in society, that place is long, long, long gone. And it is time to replace that 21st, that 20th century uh, policing with a 21st century community safety, right? That actually is invested in, in community and in keeping us safe and in, in keeping us connected to one another, right? 
That's what it means to have healthy communities. The other piece is, it is clearly time for a universal wage in America, a universal salary, right? We have nearly half of American adults without work due to no fault of their own, right? Um, we are not a strong nation, right? When people don't know how to pay their rent, how to put food on their children's tables, are going bankrupt over healthcare, right? And that leads me to the third piece. We need a one-time debt forgiveness, right? Fees, fines, loans. It is time to unshackle everyone. It is time for the Jubilee. If it is good enough for the Christian Bible, it is good enough for our society, right? It is, it is time for us to give all Americans a hand up. That is how we become a real great nation again. That's how we become a united nation again. I want to be clear, like, we, um, we have to hold complexity in this moment, right? These are the moments that call for, like, simplicity and, and, and division. And um, but we have to be complex. And the complex story is this. I'll, I'll be honest with folks. Um, we are in a moment where we just witness the end of one age and the beginning of another, right? Those are chaotic times. And the beginning of new ages are not often very pretty, right? Um, they're exhilarating, they're exciting, um, but not often very pretty. And I believe, um, quite honestly, this chapter of the story doesn't end very well, right? But I'm equally convinced that if we dig in, if we hold on to the 70 years of civil and economic rights gains we have made in this country, if we hold on to the 70 years of advancing towards inclusive democracy, that ultimately the story ends well. Our role in this moment is to preserve the paper for the next generation to write their own song, right? We are in many ways, right, the Baird Rustin generation. No one remembers Baird Rustin, right? He was the architect of the civil rights movement. Most folks don't even know his name, right? Very few of us. But he was the strategist of the civil rights movement, right? He was a gay man who had to be smuggled in and out of the South in the trunk of a car. He could never be a fully actualized human being. But he was so committed to the future generations, right? that he dug in, he took the humiliating moments to dig in to ensure that the next generation could sing their own song, right? We need to be that generation right now. We need to hold as much ground as we can for the generations that come after. Our job is to plant the tree that allows the next generation to have all the shade that it requires to bring a real equality into America. It'll be a beautiful thing. I may not see it, but as sure as I know that this chapter doesn't end well, I'm equally assured that this story ends well, right? And we just need to understand, right? In many ways, we just have to hold on to the wins. We can already be proud of how this story ends. I promise, folks. So I think, you know, folks, I'm about to read a, a poem by uh, Adrian Marie Brown. Uh, it's called Radical Gratitude Spell. And it brings me comfort because folks often ask me, what can I do? I don't feel like I'm doing enough. And I always tell folks, just find one thing, right? You don't have to do what I'm doing. You don't have to do what you see other folks doing. Find, just find that one thing you do well. Maybe it's quilting. Maybe it's writing songs, maybe it's making food, maybe, you know, who knows what it is. Maybe it's writing the most amazing notes, 
right? Maybe it's marching, maybe it's running for office, but for most of us, it's not those things. It's pretty simple things, but there's something we can do, right? And if we would focus on those things, I have friends who send me little food gifts, who send me little notes, that is just as important, right? As the folks who are marching down the streets, the folks who are running for office, right? And so I, I often think sometimes we get stuck because we think the only things that are worth doing are the things we see other folks getting news coverage with, right? And I just tell folks, start with the thing you love. If you are a good quilter, make quilts that tell these stories right now and display those quilts. Make, get your quilting club helping you. Explain to them why it's important. Build, go in front of the homes of activists and build them beautiful gardens, right? Build beautiful gardens in the front lawns of law enforcement who clearly need something beautiful in, in their lives because I don't understand how you could brutalize other people. You clearly don't have beauty, but do that thing. And so I want to thank everyone who ever hears this, right? However, throughout time this is. And I thank you for finding that one thing that brings joy to you and, and therefore brings joys to other. And so this is what Adrian Marie Brown has to say. Radical gratitude spell. It's a spell to cast upon meeting a stranger, comrade, or friend working for social or environmental justice and liberation. You are a miracle walking. I greet you with wonder. In a world which seeks to own your joy and your imagination, you have chosen to be free. Every day is a practice. I can never know the struggles you went through to get here, but I know you have swum upstream, and at times it has been lonely. I want you to know I honor the choices you made in solitude, and I honor the work you have done to belong. I honor your commitment to that which is larger than yourself and your journey, to love the particular container of life that is you. You are enough. Your work is enough. You are needed. Your work is sacred. You are here and I am grateful. <laughs>